Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be looking at winds and the forces which cause them. Wind is the horizontal movement of air from a region of high atmospheric pressure to a region of low atmospheric pressure. So as long as one place has a higher pressure than another place, air will begin to move horizontally. And as the arrow shows, it will move from the area where the pressure is higher to the area where the pressure is lower. Now, this difference in pressure that causes this horizontal movement of air that we call wind, this is a first force that we are going to be looking at. It is called the pressure gradient force and sometimes we abbreviate it by just saying PGF. Now, unlike the other forces that we will be looking at, pressure gradient force has the ability to cause air at rest to actually start moving horizontally. For the other forces, the air has to be in motion first, and then they will either affect the speed or the direction of the wind. So pressure gradient force is the initial force. It's a force that initiates the winds. Now, a good example of pressure gradient force at work is with the formation of sea breeze in the day and land breeze at night. So, during the day, the land is usually warmer than the sea. And over the sea surface where it is cooler, pressure is usually higher. Over the land where it is warmer, pressure is usually lower. So winds during the day will blow from the sea where pressure is high to the land where pressure is low. So in that case, we call it a sea breeze because we name the wind according to the direction from which they blow. At night, the land will lose its heat while the sea will retain its heat. So what we'll find is that there is a reverse, a reversal in the pressure gradient. The water being warmer will have lower pressure. The land being cooler will have higher pressure. So the wind will blow from the land where pressure is high to the sea where pressure is low. And in this case, because it's blowing from land to sea, we have a land breeze. Okay, so that is how pressure gradient force works. But as I said before, there are other forces besides pressure gradient force at work that will modify the wind after it has been set in motion by the pressure gradient force. Some of these forces, these other forces are friction, Coriolis force, and centrifugal force. Friction is basically a force that slows down uh, the wind. Of course, friction uh, is just an opposing force in nature, and we see it when we study other topics like 
earthquakes or landslides, etc. So friction is also important in the study of winds and can also oppose the, 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 the motion of, of the air and act to slow it down. Coriolis force is an apparent force uh, due to the Earth's rotation and it acts to deflect the wind or it appears to deflect the wind. Centrifugal force is a force that, uh, again, another apparent force that uh, comes into play when the air is moving in a curved path. So let's look at frictional force or frictional drag. So friction is a force which opposes the movement. Friction acts to slow the wind speed. Friction always acts in the direction which is exactly opposite to the air movement. Friction, however, will vary from one place to another uh, because it depends on the roughness of the land. We'll therefore find that the friction will be greater over land, which is usually um, a rough surface than the way it operates over the sea, all right? The higher the altitude, the lesser the frictional drag and the stronger the wind. So friction is going to vary uh, from one place to another uh, in terms of the, the type of surface it will also vary according to altitude. So when the wind is blowing over the sea, it will tend to move faster because there is less frictional drag. But when it gets to the land, it will be slowed down by increased friction. That is if there are no other uh, factors at work. And in terms of altitude, as this diagram shows, the frictional drag is greater at the surface. So the further away from the surface you go, the less will be the frictional drag, and therefore the faster the winds will blow. All right, so the next force that we want to look at is the Coriolis force. Coriolis force is the apparent deflection of the wind to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. And this is as a result of the Earth's rotation. So due to the fact that the Earth is rotating, large scale winds appear to shift from their intended course. Now, let me point out the term large scale. Uh, so when we looked at land and sea breeze, we wouldn't find a uh, Coriolis force at work so much because it's a short distance, all right? And Coriolis force operates over a longer distance. So you wouldn't find Coriolis force moderating those small scale winds. But when it comes down to large scale winds that operate over a longer distance, we're going to find the Coriolis force at work. It is an apparent shift because it's it's not as if the, the wind itself uh, shifts. It's the land beneath the wind that is rotating while the air 
appears to shift its course. So as this diagram shows, let's say that the wind were to be blowing from the equator to the to the to the north pole or to the south pole if the earth was not rotating it would blow straight to the north pole or straight straight to the south pole but when because of the earth's rotation the air appears to shift or to be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. All right, so the Coriolis force is really the ground moving at a different speed than the wind is moving above the surface. Now we want to look at some of the characteristics of Coriolis force. Some of them I might have mentioned before. So Coriolis force increases as wind speed increases. So the faster the wind, the greater is the Coriolis force. Coriolis force also increases with distance. I mentioned that before. So the longer the distance, the greater is the Coriolis force. And as I said before, winds blowing over a short distance will not be affected by the Coriolis force. Another characteristic is that Coriolis force changes only the direction, but not the speed of the wind. Coriolis force is strongest uh, at or near the poles, that is the north and the south poles. But as you move towards the equator, the Coriolis force gets weaker and weaker. And in fact, at the equator itself, the Coriolis force is non-existent. This is important when you're looking at uh, weather systems such as hurricane, for example. A lot of persons usually wonder, why is it that hurricanes are powered by high temperatures and even though uh, the equator has very high temperatures uh, hurricanes do not form there it's because hurricanes also need the Coriolis force to develop and the Coriolis force is not uh, is non-existent at the equator now what's the reason for this the, the Coriolis force is directly proportional to the angle of latitude. And so we know that latitude, we start numbering our, uh, it, it, numbering the latitude from the equator. So at the equator, the equator is considered to be zero degrees latitude. So that is one reason that the uh, Coriolis force is non-existent at the equator. Let me repeat, the force, that is Coriolis force, is directly proportional to the angle of latitude and the equator is zero degrees latitude. So the Coriolis force is non-existent there. The Earth rotates faster at the equator than at the poles. And this is because the Earth is wider at the equator than at the pole, all right? And it is rotating from the axis, that invisible line that, that, that C 
seems to pass from the North to the South Pole. Coriolis force is inversely proportional to the Earth's rotational speed. So what that means is the faster the speed, the lesser is the Coriolis force. So since the, 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 the wind, sorry, since the Earth rotates faster at the equator, the Coriolis force uh, being inversely proportional to the wind speed is going to be non-existent there. At the poles, the rotational speed of the Earth is at its minimum. Hence, the Coriolis force is at its maximum. But at the equator, the rotational speed is at its maximum. Hence, the Coriolis effect is at zero. All right. So, we've looked at pressure gradient force friction, and now we're looking at Coriolis force. When all three forces are at work, what will happen? All right. This condition where all three forces are at work will mainly happen uh, over a long distance because we need long distance for a Coriolis force to be set in motion and it is you it is it is going to also happen at ground level or surface level because we need the surface level for pressure gradient force not pressure gradient force but uh, for friction to operate so the best situation for us to see these three forces at work is at ground level over a long distance. So what will happen is that the pressure gradient force, which is the initial force, will, will set the air in motion. And the air will start moving from high pressure to low pressure. I want you to just look at the diagram as we speak so the pressure gradient force is going to be causing the air to move from high pressure to low pressure when that happens uh, after a period of of time the coriolis force is going to be set in motion and the Coriolis force will now begin to deflect the wind. Now, friction is going to slow the wind. And when the friction slows down the wind, remember Coriolis force uh, is greater when the wind speed is stronger. So because friction is slowing down the wind, the Coriolis force is still going to be acting on the wind, but it's not going to be acting as much as it would if the wind had been uh, faster. So the result is that the wind is going to, because of these three forces at work, the wind is going to be blowing from high to low pressure but not straight across it is going to be deflected to the right as long as it's in the uh northern hemisphere so if you look at that diagram that straight purple arrow is showing how the wind will end up moving So because the wind is slowed by friction, Coriolis force is weakened and the resulting wind 
blows across the, the isobar at a slanted angle. So just remember, friction can only slow the wind. It doesn't change the direction of the wind. Near the surface, the wind speed will be decreased as a result of friction. So the Coriolis force becomes weaker. And because it becomes weaker, it does not quite balance the pressure gradient force. The, the imbalance that exists between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force pulls the wind toward the low pressure. The angle at which the wind crosses the isobars will depend on the level of turbulence and the surface roughness. On average, it will blow across at an angle of about 30 degrees. All right, so an example of a wind that is affected by all three forces, which you might have studied already, um, are the trade winds. All right, so trade winds blow from 30 degrees north and south of the equator towards the equator. If the earth was not rotating, the trade winds would blow straight across from the north, north, sorry, from the north, uh, north 30 degrees or south 30 degrees towards the equator. But because of the Earth's rotation and therefore Coriolis force, the Coriolis force now tries to balance that uh, pressure gradient force. But it doesn't quite get to balance it because friction slows the wind and weakens the Coriolis force. So what results is that the trade winds will blow not perpendicular to the isobars, but will blow at an angle of about 30 degrees. So it blows across the isobar. All right. Okay, but what about a case where friction is absent? If friction were to be absent, then it means that the forces that will be at play will be the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. This usually happens at high altitudes. So at high altitudes, uh, friction is absent, pressure gradient force, therefore, is balanced with the Coriolis force. And as the, the diagram shows, when Coriolis force and pressure gradient force are balancing, then the wind that will result will blow parallel to the isobars. This wind that blows parallel to the isobars in the upper atmosphere are referred to as geostrophic winds. So let's let's look at the, 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 the diagram. Over here we have high pressure. Over here, we have low pressure. All right. Sorry, I'm saying over here, but you're, you're unable to see me pointing. Okay. So the wind will, if, if, if it was only the, the pressure gradient force at work, the wind would, would blow perpendicular 
to the isobars and will blow straight from high pressure to low pressure. But because of the Earth's rotation and Coriolis force, the Coriolis force balances the pressure gradient force. And because it balances the pressure gradient force, it causes the wind to blow parallel or in the same direction as the isobars. So let's look again on another diagram. When the wind first begins to move, remember only pressure gradient force will be present at the initial stage. So notice how, how the arrow starts off straight because it is it's the, 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 the wind with Coriolis, with pressure gradient force um, operating alone, the wind would normally blow straight from high pressure to low pressure. But as the Coriolis force begins to set in motion and increase with distance, then the Coriolis force begins to balance the pressure gradient force until the wind begins to take a path which is parallel to the isomars. And as I said before, this is called geostrophic winds. Now, geostrophic winds, this is very important. Geostrophic winds will only occur where the isobars are straight or the wind is flowing in a straight path. All right? But this is not something that is common. So what is more common is for winds to move in a curved path and isobars to be actually curved. Now, as long as there is a curved path, another force is going to be initiated. All right, or another force is going to be operating. Isobars are almost always curved. When the isobars are curved, an additional force enters into the balance of forces. This is called the centrifugal force, which acts, acts outward from the center of curvature. Centrifugal force is the apparent outward force on a mass when it is rotated. This is balanced with the centripetal force, which acts inwards. So when centrifugal force is operating, we're no longer going to be talking about geostrophic winds. We're going to be talking about gradient winds. Gradient winds, just like the geostrophic winds, will blow parallel to the isobars. But these winds are no longer balanced only by the pressure gradient and the Coriolis forces. And they do not have the same velocity as a geostrophic winds have. The gradient wind is flow around a curved path where there are three forces, pressure gradient force or PGF, Coriolis force, which is controlled by the Earth's rotation, and centrifugal force, which operates when there is a curved path. All right, 
So these curved paths usually exist uh, when we have high pressure centers and low pressure centers. In other words, they occur when we have uh, cyclonic conditions. All right, so as we can see from the diagram, the isobars are now curved, which means that centrifugal force is also going to join the other two forces. And we are still thinking of a situation where we are it's still in the upper atmosphere, so friction is not at work. So we're just looking at three forces. Around a low pressure center, the pressure gradient force will direct the wind inwards, as the diagram shows. So the, 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 the low pressure will be at the center, high pressure will be outwards. Now, if the pressure gradient force is pulling inwards, then the Coriolis force is going to try to balance that force. And so the Coriolis force is going to be acting outwards. Since the centrifugal force always act outwards to the center of rotation, it means that the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force will be acting in the same direction. The result is that the winds will uh, be slowed down. So please understand that all the forces must balance themselves. So since the pressure gradient force, let's look back at it, since the pressure gradient force is the only force that is acting inwards in this case, and the other two forces are acting outwards, these two forces, the, the, the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force, must balance with the pressure gradient force. Now, the pressure gradient force will not be changed in the process. So the only force that, 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 that has to, 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 to make an adjustment is the Coriolis force. So the Coriolis force will get weaker. And when it gets weaker, this is going to cause the wind speed to decrease. So in this case of low pressure system or a trough, the gradient wind blows parallel to the isobars and it blows slower than the geostrophic wind. All right, so that is around an area of low pressure or a trough. Please remember, around a trough, the wind is going to get slower. All right. When it comes on to a center of high pressure, where, where the highest pressures are at the center, that's what I mean, again, the three forces are going to be at play, but they are going to be operating differently. In this case, when the pressure is highest at the center, then pressure gradient force is going to be acting outwards. 
in other words, going to be causing the air to move uh, from the center of high pressure and outwards. The, Cor the Coriolis force is now going to try to balance the pressure gradient force. And so the Coriolis force is now going to be moving or be acting inwards. Remember, the centrifugal force always act outwards. So this is this is opposite to what we talked about before, because in this case, the Coriolis force will, will be the only force that is acting inwards, whereas the pressure gradient force along with the centrifugal force will be acting outwards. So in this case, the wind is going to speed up. The Coriolis force must again be the force that adjusts to create the balance because the pressure gradient force is not going to change. So, because the pressure gradient force is going to be acting in the same direction as the centrifugal force, the Coriolis force must increase in order to create the balance. And this is going to cause the wind to speed up. So this means that in a high pressure system or a ridge, the gradient wind blows parallel to the isobars, but it's going to be blowing faster than the geostrophic winds. All right, so this diagram is basically showing uh, what we already talked about how the the wind will blow where there is a trough which is an area of low pressure and where there's a ridge which is an area of high pressure now which wind or wind system have you actually studied where this concept is applicable all right so you would have also studied the jet stream and when you studied the jet stream you learned that within the jet stream or at times the jet streams might begin to meander and those meanders are called Rosby waves. So the, the jet streams begin to, to develop Rosby waves. When those Rosby waves are developed, uh, if, if we have, uh, it, it might create ridges and, and troughs. All right, let me say that again. When, when, when Rosby waves develop in the jet streams, it will create ridges and troughs. And when we have ridges and, and troughs, then that is going to be a situation where the air is flowing in a curved direction. Now, what will happen is that as the air approaches the trough, please look at the diagram as I speak. As the air approaches the trough, remember what we said would happen. It is going to 
slow down. The reason it is slowing down is because the pressure gradient force will be acting inwards, whereas the other two forces will be acting outwards. And the Coriolis force will have to be reduced in order to create the balance. So if you notice, a balance a balance must be preserved at all times, all right? So this, when the Coriolis force adjusts itself or becomes weaker, then uh, in the process, the wind speed decreases. Now, when the wind speed decreases, it creates convergence in the upper atmosphere. In other words, when there is convergence, it's almost like there is the wind is piling up. Now, when that happens, the air must go somewhere. And because we're talking about the upper atmosphere now, when that piling up or convergence takes place, or we call it inflow, when that happens, the air is going to sink to the surface, and that is how, or, or that is going to contribute to the development of anticyclones. Now, as the wind continues its journey in the upper atmosphere, and it comes near to a ridge, it is going to speed up. Why is it speeding up? It is speeding up because the Coriolis force will have to try to balance on one side the pressure gradient force and the centrifugal force. And in order to create that balance, the Coriolis force will have to increase. And so this increases the overall uh, speed of the wind. So because the wind is now moving faster, it is going to, in order to avoid <laughs> It's difficult for me to 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 to, to um, the terms to, to to pull the terms to actually explain what I'm trying. All right, so because the wind is moving faster, it's almost like a, a, a vacuum could be created, and to avoid this vacuum from being created because the, the air is moving out. Uh, from 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 a particular point so fast, then air from beneath the surface or at the lower the lower sorry not beneath the surface from the the surface from the lower atmosphere will begin to move upwards to take its place. So air will be rising, and that rising of air will cause depressions to be created near to the surface, all right? So as you can see, this, this is going to be affecting the development of anticyclones and depressions, all right? Uh, if we get the chance, we will look at these winds in greater details in another video. All right, so this is where we are going to close. In summary, remember winds are initiated by pressure gradient force. And they are 
slowed down by frictional force. They are deflected by Coriolis force, which is the result of the Earth's rotation. And whenever the air is flowing in a curved path, centrifugal force is also going to become a part of the forces controlling the winds. I hope that was helpful. If you enjoyed, if you learned anything, if you benefited in any way, uh, I want you to share the love. So I'm going to ask you to share this video with somebody else. And if you have not yet subscribed, I'm going to ask you to just go ahead right now and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.